but it is a very very good book when it comes to comes to looking into these into these type of things and he in that in that book he's got uh, there's a couple of sections on logic and a couple of sections on the right belief systems and stuff uh, and I would if, if you were looking for a place to go that would be that would kind of be the place okay awesome um, yeah get the if you don't already own it get the Baker Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics it's worth it's worth looking into and reading every once in a while yeah um, it's faith strengthener yeah for sure for sure and so that was a good one golly don't don't remember any of the other ones I just remember the the Oz Guinness one it's okay uh, um r- real quick ahead. something you said in your testimony um you said uh you uh, what did what did you just say uh earlier you said something about um all religions um can't be right so mm-hmm. one of them's right or all of them are wrong or what, what was that was it, what you said Somebody said something to me that was really influential, and they, he said, all religions say that they are the way and, and make an exclusive claims to the truth. And yeah. so either one is right or none is right. Right. So, and then in your testimony on Future Quake, you had said that there was, was it Einstein or it was some scientist or something had made some sort of uh, statement as well about like if God is, um, you know, um, how, how do I say it? If He's all encompassing or whatever, I forget. What you, I, I can't remember the quote. I should have wrote it down. But you you quoted somebody, and it, it kind of drew into that. Mm. That was a long time ago, my friend. <laughs> I forget. It was really good though. Mm-hmm. Not good enough for me to remember. Apparently, I'm sorry. Yeah, about well, that. Or, or me for that matter. I probably <laughs> just made it up. It's probably not. Even. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll yeah. move. We'll move along. <laughs> yeah. Are we at the point where you accepted the Lord, or are we going to talk a little bit more about how you got into that? Or, well, um, you know, it was it was more of a it, it was just sort of looking at facts and investigating the resurrection. And it's kind of where it really came down to. Yeah. And I was willing to give sort of some intellectual dissent, but I wasn't ready to, you know, to cry out for mercy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the Lord had to do uh, the Lord had to do some arm twisting. Sure. And and that's that's really what happened, you know. Yeah. So uh, you know things kind of fell apart in my life, and the Lord kept trying to 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 sort of make it more and more plain, and you know it finally led to me crying out for mercy, and and it changed, you know, my life changed at that point, you know, I felt it physically change, you know. Yeah. So you you had kind of got it gotten a hold of you through various uh, portals there, and and you mm-hmm. you made a decision to follow Christ. I did, I did, and um, and things really turned around in a pretty dramatic, pretty dramatic way, and it was it was it was pretty wild, you know. I went mm-hmm. from really being really having a tough time to really getting into a lot of good bands and and really doing a lot of playing and and. It was just, it was pretty, pretty remarkable. And so I did that for a few years and then ended up feeling like the Lord, you know, I was unhappy where I was, so I sort of inquired the Lord about what the deal was. And he said, I felt like he wanted me to move to Nashville, so I moved to Nashville. And then once I got here, uh, I felt the Lord had kind of told me strongly that I wasn't supposed to play music anymore. And he was going to let me know what, what happened next. Uh, long story short, is I wound up in in ministry, for better or for worse. <laughs> it was it was not you know the one thing I didn't want to do, and and probably tried to do all the things of you know going around going around it, but there you have it you know. Yeah. It wasn't that the door was opened. It was like, well, you were in a room that was shrinking, and there's only one door open, so. Mm-hmm. Guess where you're going? <laughs> <laughs> yep. That's cool. Or, yeah. It's uh, yeah. I, I, I have to say that like when I came to Christ, it was definitely a, it was a life changing thing. It wasn't just, you know, a feeling. It was everything changed when that happened. You know, so, uh-huh. and and I know that you can relate to that. Um, so moving into 
after you became a believer and got into some like ministry and things like that, when did you start to kind of open your eyes to, I guess, the bigger picture of, I guess, dare we say, control that we're under or the system or, I guess, the new world order, we can call it? Mm -hmm. Well, I was always, I always, I've always had a fairly wide streak, I guess you might call it, of not liking the state and, and just being sort of generally libertarian. Yeah. I just don't like being told what to do. My poor wife has had to, you know, to put up with that, and I've tried really, really hard to, <laughs> you know, to not to, you know, to try to try and listen and be supportive and all that sort of stuff, and to take those sort of things to heart. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, that's that's uh, a, a real a real issue. So I was I was pretty open to that stuff anyway. Yeah. And I remember having shades of it, even as a young kid. I, I remember sitting watching, it must have been 60 Minutes, or maybe it was the news, some other type of kind of gotcha news program where they go and they investigate the issues and find out what's going on, and, you know, it's a tell-all thing. And they had found, they were reporting on these court cases where uh, all of the cigarette companies were being investigated for making, using genetically modified tobacco and putting all sorts of stuff in there, knowing that they could cause cancer, and then doing it anyway because they were so highly addictive. And uh, I remember as a young kid watching the thing, and it being the cigarette companies being ruled, being it, they ruled against them. Uh, they ruled against all the cigarette companies, all the all the uh, um, the courts did. And that being, I, I'm watching this tell-all about how that they are secretly growing this, they engineered this, genetically engineered this crop of tobacco to grow with super, super addictive high level, high levels of nicotine and other addictive uh, things in the, in the tobacco. And I thought, wow, well that's heavy. I mean, this will be like the end of smoking because all of these companies will have to go out of business and they're, and that's what's happened. But then nothing happened, and I was like, well, how come nothing happened? Right. That doesn't make any sense. And, and it always, that thing especially left a really indelible mark on me. I did not understand how a company could get away with, you know, basically selling people something toxic and knowing they were doing so, then lying about it, and then getting... And then getting away with it, which is sort of a slap on the wrist to keep it on going. I thought that doesn't make that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Um, and so early on in my life, I was kind of open generally to conspiracy theory stuff. And then when I was in my early twenties, you know, I lived in the Bay Area, and and Bohemian Grove is just up, kind of you might say up the road almost. Yeah. So it's just up the road, and basically got asked to go. Really. Uh, yeah, another friend of mine was buddies with a very prominent scientist who was asked. The scientist was an older guy. He was a younger guy, and they were they were both musicians, and they kind of knew each other that way, that that way. So they asked. He asked me. He's like, it was funny. He said, "Dude, you have to go with me to this thing," and I didn't know anything about it. And he said, "Yeah, it's this thing where all of these super super rich people kind of all come together and." They do weird stuff, and it's a big party. And I said, well, why, what makes you think that I want to go? <laughs> and he said, he said, well, you know, it's, it's, I need somebody who's just not going to take any BS off anybody, because if it gets weird, I, you know, I just need somebody, and I said, well, just, just tell me what you, you know, what, what you're talking about. And he said, Okay, look, I need somebody who's not afraid to punch somebody in the face if it gets really weird. <laughs> and, and, and you're like the guy. And I said, really? He said, yeah, I mean, you don't take anything off of anybody. I said, well, I, I guess that's a compliment. That's good. <laughs> <clears throat> but anyway, he tried to get me to go to Bohemian Grove, and then he kind of he started filling, in, filling me in on some of the more lurid aspects of it. Yeah. And I said... There is absolutely no way that I'm going to a big two-week gay sex fest where they worship a giant stone owl. 
um, <laughs> there's no way I'm going. And he said, well, all right, all right. So he went and came back, and uh, we didn't see each other for a few weeks, and then he, he said, hey, let's, let's, let's do lunch. And, and so he wanted to talk, and he said, so guess what? I said, what? He said, it's all true. I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, what's true? He said, I mean, the Bohemian Grove stuff. I said, really? Oh, wow. And so he started telling me about all the stuff that he saw and this and that, and it happened, and all this crazy stuff happened, and, and kind of the really big wigs, they stay off kind of by themselves over in their own little spot. But, you know, George Bush was there, and Colin Powell was there. and Right. Um, you know, they were all, everybody, everybody was there, you know, so that was weird, so, so that made me start looking into that, some of that stuff, and just a, a year or so later was when Alex Jones kind of, Jones kind of blew the lid off of all of that stuff, and I was like, wow, I've actually driven up there a couple of times. Yeah, yeah, I heard, I heard that episode where you did. Yeah, I, I've driven up there, I had a friend, I was visiting some friends, we started a, when we were in college, we, we started, I mean, I say it was my idea, but they say, no, it was their idea. Uh, we, had, <laughs> we, started a, we started kind of a big weekend party in the middle of, middle of July, um, just because there wasn't, you know, it was, it, it, it kind of went, went all over the place, but there was no really good party dates that we had had for, for about that time. And so, well, you know, it, it originally started in the middle of March, and then we moved it to July. But uh, we called it Meat Fest, and it was just basically a big excuse to everybody to get together and get like four or five barbecues going and barbecue a bunch of meat. Uh, so I was out there visiting visiting them for Meat Fest, and I started telling them about all this stuff. And I said, it's right up the road. They had all moved to Healdsburg, uh, and they were all living together in this big house kind of out in the country. And I said, man, this happens like 30 minutes down the road. And they all said, oh, you're crazy. You don't know anything. And you're a fool, and you're, you know, you're a crazy conspiracy theorist. I said, no, <laughs> it's totally true. And I told them the story, and uh, and they didn't believe me. And so finally, I, I made one of them jump in the car, and we drove up there. And sure enough, you know, it was like going on, and, you know, a bunch of cars in the parking lot. And I tried to talk my way in, and that didn't go very far. And, and, and so then... I told Mike Bennett about all of it, so he interviewed me, and, and that was kind of it. You know, it's so silly. You know, people, they, you tell them about it, they don't believe him. Right. And then you show them, you show them video, and they still don't believe you. Then you go and you show them, show them audio of, like, Richard Nixon talking about him in the Watergate tapes, and they still don't believe you. And so then you, <laughs> then you, they, you drive them out there. And you see, like, you know, obviously we didn't get on, on the campus, but we got stopped by a guy in a big purple jumpsuit with a bohemian grove, like a circle with a big owl in the middle. Yeah. And weaving spiders not, you know, weaving spiders don't come here, whatever it is. You know, and then he's like, okay, well, this might be, okay, uh, maybe, maybe. <laughs> what do you mean, maybe? Maybe. <laughs> yeah. The guy that I took out there, I think he kind of, I think, I think that really... You know, to be fair, I think that really did change him because he, uh, you know, he got real quiet and thought about it. And, you know, if, if I bring it up around people, then they, you know, he kind of, he doesn't, he doesn't say it doesn't exist, you know. He goes, yeah, I went out there. Seems like it, seems like it exists. Yeah. So I was always kind of open to it. Mm -hmm. But it didn't really, it, it wasn't something that was really sort of life life altering sure. like yeah now i mean it's it's my sort of default to sort of believe that the people in charge really aren't the people in charge to to kind of believe that the people in charge a certain percentage of them are really really sick individuals and to get away with what what they want to get away with is why they went to go and be in charge in the first place because they can manipulate manipulate events and and are are you know working towards a you know, one world government and all of that stuff. But but obviously, Future Quake doing Future Quake was a pretty big, uh, pretty big education. Yeah. You know, having having to kind of read up on stuff each week and 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 hanging out with Mike Bennett. You know, I look at it now, and being around Mike Bennett was a very 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 helpful thing because he's such a great 